in God we trust. Um, we're going to talk about how to recognize goading. Uh, by way of review, we read in Acts 26, it's in the passage under letter A. Look there with me. There's a sheet in the worship folder with verses written out. Um, Paul believed he was on a mission from God. Look at the um, Acts 26, verse 9. He writes, speaking to the king and giving him an account of what happened to him, how his ministry began. He said, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time, I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. He believed he was on a mission from God, and what he was to learn from, an, from a confrontation with Jesus is that he was really on a mission from God. That's what he says. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. A goad is a prod. It's a means to control animals, to force the animal to go where you want them to go. I looked at a um, hardware store, and they have goads, but now they're electric. And they're expensive, so I was going to get one to have a visual aid. But a goad, in that sense, was a pronged stick. Um, to kick against the goad is the, to resist the influence of the goad, to resist going in the direction that you're being goaded to walk in. And in this passage, it's common to interpret God as being the one goading, that God is goading, prodding Paul to recognize that Jesus is God and to recognize that what Jesus says is what God says. And Paul keeps on resisting. This is how it's commonly seen. He kicks against God's influence. He kicks against God's goads. This appeals to us in a way, we talked a little bit last week, we like to think of God as a gentleman. He doesn't impose himself on human free will. But this really doesn't fit the picture Paul paints. He writes, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground. He didn't determine whether he's going to fall to the ground or not. Let me see. I wonder if I'm going to fall to the ground or not. Do you feel like falling to the ground? I don't. I don't. Do you? What they saw, light, and then the next thing they knew, they were licking dust. And that seems to be God's influence was irresistible. And when God wants to exert influence, he doesn't have any problem doing that, and he does do so. So if it's not God gently prodding Paul to try to get him to recognize something that Paul is resisting, what does Jesus mean when he says it's hard for you to kick against the goads? A goad is also the weapon of a conquered people. So when the Israelites were under the dominion of the, pa the Philistines, they weren't allowed to have weapons. So if you want to generate a movement to resist the Philistines or the Romans, you have to find something that you can use as a weapon. And goads were used. They'd sharpen goads and use them to not just to prod animals, but to defend themselves. So a goad, then, is the weapon and symbol of a resistance movement. And at this point, Israel is un under the dominion of the Roman Empire. They are a vassal of Rome, and as such, they are under the power of Rome. There was an increasing movement within the first century to push off Roman rule the way they pushed off Greek rule about a century and a half earlier. And a goad, then, is a symbol of this movement, this resistance of a conquered people. As a Jewish leader, Paul would have been pressured to join the Jewish resistance movement to Roman rule. And this created a problem. 
because Paul pledged allegiance to two different um, governments, two different countries. As a Jewish, a Jewish citizen, and he would be expected to embrace the Israelite Zionist cause. He was expected to. But as a Roman citizen, he was expected not to. So he was pulled in half. He's pulled in half. If he favors Rome, he is pulling against his Jewishness. If he favors his Jewishness, he's pulling against his Romanness. He's caught in between. This doesn't make it goading yet, though. I think as we have talking about it, for it to be goading, there needs to be a sacred component. There needs to be a sacred element. God's got to enter the picture. And the, his fellow Pharisees make sure that God does enter the picture. They were convinced that it was God's will to overthrow Roman oppression. Therefore, they believed that it was God's will for Paul to champion their cause. And they would have used fear, obligation, and guilt to get Paul to move in the direction they wanted him to move. Help us. Help us overthrow Roman rule. In God's name, they goaded Paul to take up their cause and to get involved. It's when they recruited this sacred element. This is where it became goading and where it pulled Paul in half. JC and I, JC, come on up. We have been, we're going to be teasing this out. Um, that's not good. JC, last week we talked a little bit about the elements of goading. And uh, you described, we talked about who, what, and why. Tell us a little bit about goading. Well, how many remember the symbol? I heard on video it didn't go over very well. One finger, right? Two finger. Gun, right? And goading is, from, goading is our attempt to leverage or to gain weight when we're torn. And it could go one way or the other, so I put something on the scale. And I think that's why we naturally will pull down heaven. Because who could argue with God? Can you? And so we might say God says or the Bible says or those kinds of things to get people to move in a direction we want them to move. So, Jay, and we could, there's, there's indications that there are movements that align God with America right. and would have us understand that God wants America to be the best nation. So it exists on that level, but how does goading exist then within families? What would it look like to call on God's authority to, to impose influence on uh, somebody? So, so that ends up, for me anyway, looking like, well, let me give you, anybody want to hear a typical phone call I get at the office? <laughs> You want to hear a phone call? Here's how it goes. Ring. I pick up. Well, no. Gina says, it's for you. So <laughs> I pick it up. I say, hello. And the first question is, are you a Christian counseling agency? And I say, no. And they say, wait, 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 wait. I said, well, I'm a grace-based counseling agency. Oh, okay, okay. That's good. That's good. I was thinking about me and my wife coming for marriage therapy. I said, cool, cool. That's a good thing. Um, lots of couples come. He says to me, so what do you think about um, headship? I say, mm, don't know. What do you think? He says, particularly, what do you think about Ephesians 5? I say, which part? He says, what about women submitting to their wives? Now, this is the husband calling. You know what I say? Wrong verse. Guess what happens? Click. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's an attempt to goad, and what's going on in the family is this guy is saying, you are supposed to submit to me. That's not his verse. His verse is, you're supposed to lay down your life and cherish your wife. Oh, now I have some guys who last past that, and I say, so your verse is, and then they say, well, if she would submit, I could love her more. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, jeez. Jiminy Christmas, here we go. Okay, so that's one thing. Or another kind of goading that happens is my expertise is 30 years working with substance abuse and kids. So, so, so as you can imagine, when a young person says, mom comes home, 
is in the room, kid's not home, looking for where to put the underwear, opens the drawer and finds a sack or finds a one-hitter. And they didn't know this kid was about that kind of stuff. Then they'll call me up and we, we have a conversation. And for fear, a parent is willing to do stuff that they could regret for a long time. And so my job is, I used to be joining the fear. I used to join the goading because they would say, the kid's going to die, blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like, yeah, we got to get him in, blah, blah, blah. And now I'm like, slow down, slow down. I'm not saying that stuff that's in that drawer wasn't the, your kids, but boy, jumping on the bandwagon and dragging this kid to even a therapist is, might not be the right deal. Okay, but goading happens in. Well, we're a Christian family. We don't do this thing. And I'm saying to the mom, obviously, we do. <laughs> or your kid does. And your kid isn't reflecting your values. They're reflecting their own. Right? So the challenge comes then when we get afraid or there's some obligation we think we're supposed to do as parents or a husband or a wife, or we feel guilty because, and when we feel guilty, we tend to go. Or when a kid's behavior makes me feel guilty. So my son just broke into my neighbor's garage. Might provoke goading of my kid for doing that, because now I feel guilty about what he's done. And that's the kid's stuff. That's not my stuff, but... As parents, I take it on just like anybody else, you know. So my job is, my, my call is to try to help people figure out who's responsible for what and then how to exert the right kind of influence. I, I always say to my parents and to my couples, let's provide helpful help for one another, not hurtful help. Because I see people engage in battle and they get the gun out and instead of using the twenty two, they want to get the forty five Magnum out. Because this is my kid's life. Or my wife did this to me. Or my husband did this to me. We start goading. And that's when we start invoking God on that stuff as well. Right? And it's, it's a hurtful thing. You talked about goading as fog-based spiritual influence. And in the case with Jesus and Paul, Jesus understood that it was hard for Paul to resist the influence of his fellow Pharisees. It was hard for him to kick against the goads. He was being pulled by divided loyalties, Roman and Jewish, and he was being pulled in half. And we go when we use fear, obligation, and guilt to influence people to obey God. We take out the heavy weapons in order to get people to move in the direction that God wants them to move in, and we're just cloaking ourselves. We just are asking them to do what God wants them to do. But in using fear, obligation, and guilt, that's when it becomes goading, and that's what they would have subjected Paul to fear. You know, the Romans are going to take away our religious liberties. And if, you did, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem, Paul. You know, and, and Paul, you are a Pharisee, and a Pharisee is a governmental leader. And you do remember, Paul, that when the Greeks, when we were overthrowing the Greeks, it was the Pharisees, the Hasidim, that took leadership. You get the weight of this, and it would have been pulling Paul in that direction. We go when we use fog to influence people to obey God. We go when we put shoulds. We put shoulds in God's mouth. God said, you should do this and should do that. Uh, whenever we use fear, obligation, and guilt to get people to obey, we go. And ultimately, we go because we believe God goads. It's the way we interpret this verse, that God's influence is kind of like this. He kind of sticks you and just kind of little nuances, little things that we try to interpret. What's God teaching me? He took away my job. I wonder what he's trying to tell me. And we tend to envision God as doing that, as micromanaging. And then we try to figure it out because we, God kind of goes and we try to figure out what he's doing so that God will call off the goons. You know, God sends these troublesome little things and if we could figure out what God's doing, we all, great lesson. Boy, well, that was great. And so now you can just take these circumstances away. That's the way we tend to envision God. Paul would have struggled with believing because it's hard. Again, when J.C. was talking, and as you're thinking, okay, J.C., well, why don't you, as parents, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to do nothing and let our kid use the stuff that's in the drawer? It's tricky. 
This is not something that is cut and dry. It's not clean. And for Paul, it wasn't clean either. He would have struggled with whether or not Pharisees were speaking for God. He would have wondered. The Old Testament talks a lot about Jerusalem being liberated. Um, he learned that they weren't speaking for God. Again, that they were speaking for God. We goad when we rush at someone to get them moving. We rush at someone. There's something fearful. There's an obligation or a guilt. And to goad is to rush at them. And the person we rush at might be somebody else or might be ourselves. You better get... It's, and that's what goading is. You, to go it is kind of to, to prod somebody to be where they really already should have been. <laughs> you should already have been over here, and you're over here, so get. Um, when we use fear, obligation, and guilt, and we do so in God's name, that's what, that's goading. Let me illustrate the difference between the voice of God and the voice of goad. The voice of God says, don't just sit there, do something. And it's, it's based in fear. And there's the sense of urgency, and you better deal with this now. And, and then we run off on a mission from God, and sometimes it turns out it's not a mission from God. It's a mission from God. You know what God God says, don't just sit there, do something. You know what God says? Don't just do something, sit there. Don't just do something, sit there. You might do something in the future, but connection comes before correction. Sit. Be real. Be still. Speak freely with me. And you can wait perseveringly and respond gently. Don't just do something, sit there. Put away your cell phone for a second. Don't call the neighbor or the council. Yeah, again, you're going to do these things. But we tend to make better decisions when we're not doing this. <laughs> when, we, when, we, when we're hyperventilating, everything's all or nothing. It's a rushing kind of thing. And what JC tries to do when he gets on the phone, it's just settle down. Let's think this through. Tend to make better decisions. Somebody used to indicate wisdom Wise decisions are made from right here. Wise decisions are made from right here. And I say, made from right here. When the breathing is down here, it's deep. We tend to make better decisions as opposed to decisions that are made up here. <laughs> See, it's, it's, and, and, and that seems to be what goading is about. One of the luxuries of deity is that you don't have to rush. You got things under control. God doesn't bite his nails. If you look at God's nails, he, God's not up in heaven going, you know, wondering what, oh, what's, the, what's the market going to do and what's Russia going to do and oh my goodness, what's he going to do? And, and she's not, oh, he's not. God doesn't bite his nails. God doesn't have indigestion. God doesn't have an ulcer. One of the luxuries of deity you can be at rest. Your plan is unfolding. And you can't get in the way of it. And you know what? That's good news because his plan is good. Your mess up cannot get in the way of God's plan being unfolded. I'm going to say this again. Your behavior cannot get in the way of God's plan coming to fruition. We're not that big. When we go, we think we go. Oh, I got God's depending on me. No, he isn't. No, he isn't. Um, JC, come on back up. What, so it it seems like <clears throat> to get people to obey God. I mean, they should obey God, isn't it? That's the. It's better to obey God. So, <clears throat> what's the big deal? As long as they do the right thing, what's the problem? Doesn't the end justify the means? No, no. Why I mean not? Oh, God. <laughs> no. I mean, I, my sense is this. If you're going to go, don't do it in God's name. Just do it in your own name. And then live with the consequence of it. Because goading always 
destroys relationships. So the ends justifies the means for a, an expected result. You know, if if it's a kid and they're they're not going to use, and you're going to do whatever you got to do to stop them from using, then then don't pretend like you don't don't pretend like you're highly highly invested in the relationship because you won't you can't be. You're going to grab this kid by the throat, do the things you got to do to get them to sober up, and then and then they're going to go. Maybe they sober up, maybe they don't, but I guarantee you the relationship's trashed. It takes a whole lot more grace and mercy to sit for a bit. And um, because the ends doesn't justify the means, if relationship and connection's important. <coughs> what I see happen and what has happened in my own life is when I'm going through things, the thing that holds me is not the person who demands a performance. The thing that holds me is the person who is helios to me, who understands with compassion. Now, you can understand with compassion with some lines. There are some things that I say to parents about they have to have some lines about where they stand on things. Um, and you hold your line, okay? And you hold your line in the name of love. But there are some things that you won't do because, you know, because because it, it steps outside the line of love. It doesn't step outside the line of 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 demanding people change. But what I know in the long term is if we quickly, you know, I'll get a call, can you do an intervention? And they want me to meet with the family in two weeks and then and and then get Larry in to, so we can fix him. And I say, Well if I'm gonna do an intervention, I'm gonna spend three months talking with you first. Well that's too long. Really what I'm trying to get them to do is buy some time. Buy some time to breathe, to relax, you know, and and to, because if, I, if I'm going to confront somebody I love, I got to confront them with what I've experienced. The Bible says, um, go to that brother or sister as a witness. That doesn't mean uh, that doesn't mean it's right or wrong. That means I've experienced the harm. I've experienced the harm. And so I can say to you, here's how I here's where I'm coming from when I think about where you're going. And then I give kids the opportunity or give adults the opportunity to make a choice. I mean, we all want choices. Golding makes an attempt to remove. There's three choices on the table. Golding will try to remove two of them. So you just have one choice. As soon as you do that, you're going to get resistance. As soon as you do that, you get relationship damage. So um, protection at any means is a threat to long-term relationships. And most parents don't want that. Most uh, husbands and wives don't want that. Most grandmas and grandpas don't want that. They want the kid to come around, but they also want to be the person that supports that change. Right? So, <clears throat> We're going to talk about how to recognize goading. And we're going to say a couple things. One of the characteristics of goading is animosity. Um, it says in the passage, Paul writes, in my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. An obsession is, word comes from to rave. It's really to kind of be a lunatic. And Paul says, I turned into a raving madman. And, and he would go to these places, and he would issue charges, and there'd be spit flying out of his mouth. And he went on, and he just, he hooked up the team, and we're going to go to Damascus, and we're not going to take hostages. We're not going to spare anything. And, and so he describes himself as having been a raving madman. And Jesus identifies the root of his problem. Ask a question, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Good question. Well, because I'm right. and Because what, it, Jerusalem is supposed to be... be, well, be and then Jesus gives him the answer. Here's the answer. It's because it's hard for you to kick against the goad. That's why you're persecuting me, because it's hard for you to kick against the goads. Uh, being pulled in half was taking a toll on Paul. It was hard to resist being goaded. Again, when somebody has a strong agenda, and especially when it's right, and they're saying there's not two options, there's just one, to resist that, to kick against that goad, 
to not go in the direction is hard. And it was hard for Paul when they were prodding him to pick up the, the cause of Jewish resistance. And he had to look around and say, look, man, you know what? I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I just can't get on board. I, what, what do you mean you can't get on board? But aren't you one of us? Don't you care about Israel? Don't you care about God? And you know what Paul had to do? He had to swallow and it was hard. And so how did he deal with the tension? He found a solution. Hmm. He could do something that would curry favor with the Pharisees and not offend Rome. And you know what that was? Let's blow up the church. Blow up the Christian church. The Roman government wasn't all that. They, they didn't understand, but they, they weren't opposed to it. The Jewish government was. And so what Paul then ended up doing is he found a cause that he could sink his teeth into when he went after the Christian church. Do you know one way of, of finding relief from internal tension? He was getting pulled apart inside. And there's a sense of sadness when you're pulled inside. You can't really be accepted either way. And shame. You start to, you know what we end up doing? We use mad to bury sad. Rather than be sad, you know what you can do? Be mad. Mad's powerful. Mad's about victim. It's their fault. They're the thing. It's not that I'm getting pulled inside. It's that's the problem. And we use mad to bury sad. And we use blame to bury shame. And that still feels, but it feels a little more powerful. Because sad feels vulnerable. Shame feels vulnerable. And what we do, we put up the armor. We take out the sword. We pick up the gold. Okay, come on. How, tell us a little bit about this, JC. Talk about how goading can produce or evidence itself in aggression. Again, there's an inside thing happen, but what Jesus seems to indicate, the reason why Paul's blowing up people is because he's getting goaded. How does that work? Well, it's easy. I mean, uh, how many of you are passionate about something? Raise your hand if you're passionate about something. Politics, love, whatever. Passionate about something. And, and when there's an obstacle or when I'm torn means the passion that I have I can't get to. Now, so, so my image was, some of you don't know this because you didn't see this, but there was a series that we did. Mike was gone, and some of you remember. Uh, I talked about the Lord of the Rings. Anybody, anybody, how many seen the Lord of the Rings? Okay, there's a character that I love. His name is Gollum. You know, you know what I'm talking about. He used to be Schmeagol, and then he killed somebody. And you know why he killed that person? The ring. That guy had what he deemed to be his. And see, so all of us have a kind of a gullum aggression. But some of us do it like this. And some of you do it like this. <laughs> I'm going to kill you, but I love you. <laughs> you got my ring. I'm going to get my ring back. You just, <laughs> I couldn't see you. Right? I mean, because what will happen with this goading thing is when we say aggression, half of you go, well, I never, I'm never mad. Really? Really? Let me take something that you think is yours. Let me intrude. Let me put you in a bind where what was yours you watched me take away or what, what you love watched me hurt. And some of you will say, no, I'm mad. And some of you will say, okay, I got to praise God. <laughs> you know, because cause you, cause you can't put that away. So my sense is that the aggressive response to cover sadness and to cover shame is a natural protection. The problem is some of us do it out loud and some of us do it, do it hidden. And, and then we judge each other for that as well. Like, well, he didn't really handle his situation very well. You know, well, I'm thinking to the person who's smiling, you didn't really handle your situation very well. Because why? The thing that's missing in both cases is we take matters into our own hands instead of saying, God. And you know what? He can handle. If, I, if, I, if I'm mad at God, he can handle it. Or if I'm afraid to be mad at God, he can handle that. 
Or if I feel ashamed, he can handle that. But most of us, and I'm including myself, is when I'm in a shameful spot, the last thing I'm doing is looking up. I'm doing this. And I'm not looking up. I got to get my, and take the weapon out of my hand and breathe. And that's the hardest thing to do. So Paul's in a position where he's torn. He's a Roman citizen, but he loves his faith. And they're poking him. So he got to find a solution. So he can't attack himself. So he finds a group of knuckleheads that he attacks called Christians. And he looks over his shoulder and he's hoping both of them go when he's killing people. Except for when he meets the Lord that he loves and really God puts him in a real bind when he says, Paul, why do you persecute me? Because I don't think Paul was thinking this had anything to do with God. He was trying to resolve this issue internally. And and that's what happens. I mean, classic example of that is, and I, I don't want to be political, but the classic example of that is any kind of racism. It's the same kind of thing where I decide a group of people are getting what we, what's mine, and I and no, and whatever you go is not a person anymore. It's a thing, right? Whether they're people, men, women, whatever, they become a thing. Children, they become a thing, and that kind of thing is natural. I think. The aggression is natural. What we do with it, it moves us. Some of us moves us towards it. Some of us moves us to kind of try to cover it up. What we what we want to do is hold it and find a way to bring it to God. That's what we want to do, right? Hmm. One of the um, how to recognize goading is animosity. Um, another one is anxiety. Look what it says in Luke 10. Luke 10, 38. It says, and Je as Jesus and his disciples were on their way to Jerusalem, I think, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came in to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? <coughs> Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you're worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. A couple words, interesting picture it paints. Distracted, it's to be drawn in different directions at the same time. It, it, as if you would picture ropes attached to her heart that have hooks in them. And when you pull these ropes, it exerts influence, force. You ever try to pull a hook out? It doesn't come out very easily. It's being pulled this way and this way distracted. That's what it's like. It's being pulled in diverse ways at the same time. To be worried is to have divided thoughts. Literally what it means. To worry or to be anxious is to have divided thoughts. Divided thoughts meaning I should be in here cooking the meal. No, I shouldn't. I should be in here sitting at Jesus' feet, cooking the meal, sitting at Jesus' feet, divided thoughts. One of her wanted to be in this place. The other wanted to be in this place. She couldn't be at both places at once. What was she experiencing? Anxiety. Anxiety. And so what did she do to deal with the anxiety? Um, she exerted influence on God. She prayed about it. Don't you care? Now, the good thing is she was honest. She said it out loud. She didn't, she said, and I don't think her hostility was very cloaked. We don't know uh, if she smiled or not. At any rate, there's one more thing. He said, you're worried, you're distracted, worried, upset. Upset is if, um, I'll, I'll describe upset. Okay, in, in three, 
I want you to, to kind of yell and make, make a, and so I'm going to ask you to do this. Okay, you remember this. Okay, one, two, three, just make, ah, okay, one, two, three. Ah! That's upset, but it was happening inside her head. It's, it's when there's an uproar, when the crowd's in a tumult, when things are loud, and if you kept being loud, it would be, it would stir things up. That's what was happening in her head. You are worried and upset about many things. You, you, you kind of want to be here and you want to be there and your thoughts are divided. And not only are your thoughts divided, but they're not very happy. And so what was happening in her head is women aren't to sit at the feet of rabbis, you know. And that's one voice she hears. The other one is saying, just make the dinner. Just make the dinner. Take the things. Put them in the pot. Just Focus on what you need to focus on. Another thing, Mary should be helping. Another thing is, why doesn't Jesus tell her to help me? And you know what? All the you, do you understand what this is like when you got when your head's loud? How many understand what it's like when your head's loud, and you feel it coming from so many different? Ah, blah, 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 blah. That's what Jesus describes. What's happening inside? Her head's like a, like a crowded place, and it's stirred up and disturbed. And, and So what's the problem? What's going on here? Maybe she resented cooking the dinner. Maybe. It's not always fun to cook dinner. But it doesn't seem to be the deal. Uh, this is sometimes late, about a year, year and a half later. Uh, and this other portion from John. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, Lazarus was Mary and Martha's brother, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. And that's it. Martha served. She didn't have a problem sitting or not sitting at Jesus' feet. So I don't think it was just about serving. You know what I think was happening? She was goading herself. Goading can happen from outside but it can happen from inside, the voices that she internalized from when she grew up. Women do not sit at the feet of rabbis, reverberating in her head. And she heard those voices. But then there is, well, what's Mary doing? And, and so these, she's goading herself. Some of us, our goading is from outside, but in every case, the reason why Paul was vulnerable and susceptible to these Jewish and Roman voices is there were Jewish and Roman receptors inside of him. If it didn't matter, their voices wouldn't have had an impact. So he was being goaded from outside, but the goading was actually inside as well, wasn't it? You're a Roman, you're a Jew. And Mary had the same, Martha had the same thing. The voices inside representing different values that didn't line up. What do you do with that? What do you do with that? When you want to be in two places at the same time, you can't be. And you're disturbed about it. And you're pushing yourself around. And that's difficult. Uh, so she discharged her tension onto Jesus. JC, come on up. This is kind of a loaded question. JC, how did, how did she say this, Jay? How did she say this thing right here? Read that. So how do you imagine oh. she said that? Lord, don't you care? <laughs> my sisters left me here all by myself. <laughs> you should tell her to help. That's what I'm saying. That's how I see it. That's how I see it. <laughs> see, Tracy's more external. <laughs> okay, so, Lord, don't you care? Like, who's left me by God's left hand? That's the mic version. <laughs> <laughs> no, this would be, Lord, don't you? Never mind. <laughs> that would be the mic version. <laughs> Jay, talk about goading and about how goading produces anxiety. So, so she's, she's divided. And the heart of the division is, She's doing what she's supposed to do as a woman, and she sees another woman doing, wait, wait, I thought the rule was, any of you have that in the house? 
the rule is in my house. And then some kid or some husband or some wife breaks that rule, right? Now, what she does first is anxious. What she does second is hostility or anger. But it's indirect. Now, I, as I was coming up here three or four times, some little birdie whispered in my ear, tell me if this is correct. <laughs> to goading is to be a mom. Is that right? <laughs> no, some, they, ain't, they ain't agreeing with you down here, birdie. <laughs> right? But, but to goading is to be a parent. Would you, would you agree with that? I see some head nods on that. To goading is to be a husband, head of the house. True? I mean, we've been taught those kinds of things. That, that so, so when we see a discrepancy, it creates discomfort and distraction, and that's anxiety. And, and anxiety doesn't necessarily have a weapon. I just feel it. It's loud in my head, and I don't know which side to go. I don't know which side I should go on. Now, what Martha does is she sees a woman not doing what she thinks is expected of women. Now, let me ask this question. How many of you have seen your kids do what seems to be what is not expected for kids to do in my house? If you say no, you lying. <laughs> because we all have those standards in our heads about what little kids, little girls, little boys, what husbands, you know, what wives are supposed to do. Is that wrong, Jay? Is it wrong to have standards? No, it's not wrong to have a standard. What, what's wrong is to assume my standard on to everybody else. And to assume the standard. Here's the problem with that. It isn't even wrong to, to have the standard in your head. But I have to share and communicate that standard. And, and, and I have to, I have, and in a marriage, that's why marriage is to cleave to your wife and leave your family. You're not just leaving your family physically, you're leaving your family in terms of the standards and the values because your wife and you are to create your code. You know, I, I was she just gave me a uh, beautiful <laughs> save the date. And that's what it reminded me of. Now, they are to create their own code. And it may have a little bit of what mom gave you and a little bit of what your family gave you. It's going to have a little bit of what Marcus you guys create your own code. And what happens is sh f fog doesn't allow that. Doesn't allow that. It doesn't, it's a should. And as soon as Martha says, she shouldn't be sitting at his feet. Now she's going to invoke God. And that happens to be God's right with her. So she goes boldly to God and says, no, really? Like, you see what's happening here? You fixing this or not? Well, you God? Let's get this. <laughs> and Jesus says, he didn't beat her up. That's the thing. Pay attention to how he responds to her. He, he didn't beat her up. She was honest with him. You know, that's the, the cure, that's the cure kind of for, not alleviation of meaning cure, but the, the salve for when you're divided. What do you do? I got to take my division to the Father. Otherwise, I'm going to take matters into my hands because if Golding doesn't get responded to, if fog doesn't get responded to, then fog's going to turn into uh, persecution because you, you're messing with my ring. And if I don't deal with the anxiety, then I'm going to go right to animosity. Mm -hmm. It's natural. And, and, and even after I go to animosity, what we're talking about is you can come back to the Father because he's not going to be looking at you going, Randy, what, what, what was you thinking? He's going to say, oh, you did it again, didn't you, buddy? <laughs> He's going to say, oh, yeah, this is like <laughs> the 20th time. And then have a conversation with him. It's not going to be shame and blame back. It's going to be understanding, compassion, and mercy, right? So, so we all go. We all go in the name of God. We all do in, God, in gold we trust, whatever this is. You know, I have a value in my house around honesty. Be dishonest in my house. You'll see God. You'll see gold. And, and it won't even be veiled. I'm going to be like, you know, because cause it, it, that, that ain't about God. It's about my fundamental value and core, right? But, but, we, but we also have to be able to respond in a different way because goading doesn't lead to relationship. It disconnects relationships. We're going to talk next week about, and worship team, come on up. We're going to talk about how to resist goading.
And if you get what we're saying, we're not saying that it's not wrong. To, it's not wrong to have standards and to be direct. I need you to do this. I need you to do that. And then we'll deal with that. The problem is not vertical influence, horizontal influence. The problem is when I recruit vertical authority for horizontal influence. God needs you to do that. That's when an opinion or a this is what I need you to do turns into something else and ends up building a resistance and a resentment of that person against the person who used fog in God's name. That's what we want to Try to be careful with. Don't use fog in God's name. Because God doesn't use fear to motivate. And he doesn't use obligation. And he doesn't use guilt. God doesn't goad. Let me pray for us. God, we really do want to represent you. It's difficult. We feel strongly about things. It's natural to raise our voices and invoke heaven. And we don't really want to uh, sacrifice the best for the good. So we get somebody to change short term, change the skin deep. That's not transformation. Transformation is heart deep, long lived. That's really what we want to be about, both towards ourselves and towards others. So we have a lot to learn about this. Help us to understand what spiritual influence looks like, what gentle spiritual influence looks like like. It doesn't seem to be right to put new wine in old skins. Wreck both of them. To put a good message within the framework of harshness and fog, it wrecks both. It's not the way you were. So, teach us. Help us to be like you. For your sake. Amen.